Now, Australia's Merino sheep is celebrating its 150th birthday. It's believed the famous breed can be traced back to just one sheep stud in New South Wales. That stud is thought to have been developed at the Wanganella Merino stud near Daniloquin. Tim Lee from ABC's Landline is the author of a new book, Wanganella and Merino Aristocrats. And he joins us now in the studio. Tim, am I pronouncing it right? Uh, Wanganella, indeed. Good. Yeah. Phew. That's, that's always, <laughs> it's always a worry in these circumstances. <laughs> no, you upset the sheep people. It's, it was the, the, the Pepin Merino, more specifically. So the Merino was here already up till. Well, from the earliest days, it actually came on the first fleet, but uh, they ate most of those early sheep <laughs> <laughs> out of necessity. But uh, we were exporting wool by 1797, you know, and uh, people like John MacArthur figure largely. But uh, really, it wasn't until 1861 when, the, when this stud started at a place called Wanganella, just north of Daniloquin in the Riverina, that Australia really took off. So you see this uh, you know, economic prosperity start to boom from that period because of this amazing sheep developed there. Tell us about the land and, and what part the land and the Riverina area played in the breeding of this sheep. Really crucial, Paul. Um, up to that point, the uh, merino was just a small thing, only weighed about 40 pounds in the old language. It, it cut about two pounds of wool and it simply couldn't survive in the inland. So sheep farming was confined to the coastal regions. Um, sheep that were sent into the inland to places like that, the old man plain they call it there, this flat yeah. uh, expanse of searing heat in the summer, uh, very cold in the, in the, in the winter months. Sheep in the summer months just wilted there. The, 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 the uh, fleece wasn't sufficient to, to sort of insulate them. The dust got in, wrecked the wool. Uh, they just died in big numbers. And more particularly, if you weren't on a river frontage like a billabong or a creek, which the squatters all you know, captured, 15 kilometres away from that was useless. So all this great tracts of pastoral land was, was unusable. So they had to get a sheep that had long legs, was tough, it could walk, you know, that distance to water at the end of the day without blinking. It needed to be a really tough animal. So this is what a pair of brothers from England, uh, pretty well uh, renowned uh, sheep breeders over there too, the Pepin brothers, George and Fred, with their father, set out to do, and they did it really spectacularly. Uh, how long does it take to, to breed a sheep to, to suit those conditions? I mean, how, how many generations does it take to get a, a sheep to adapt? Uh, quite a while. Really, though, within 20 years they'd done it, and, and uh, they were l lucky in a way because they bought the best imported uh, merino bloodlines, and the French were some way down the track. They'd bred this dual purpose animal, one that could. Uh, also be used for mutton, but could cut some good wool. So they, I think called a, a rombole was at the royal stud in, in France. And the French released these uh, wonderful genes at that stage. So the Pepins pounced on this, they bred it with the German merino. The Germans are also trying to breed this better wool, this fine wool. And they crossed them, and uh, great debate, it's still a debated issue how they did it. But within 20 years, they really had this animal that to, could, if the wool price was low, they could uh, put it in a can for mutton <laughs> or, uh, you know, fatten it for markets uh, or, you know, th they could also get the wool off it. So it was this sort of uh, really landmark event which has to this t stage been really sort of underdeveloped uh, or under underknown in, in history. Yeah. Uh, for, for whatever reason, I don't know. But uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you say some of the uh, how they managed to go about doing that at the time still debated as to how they've actually done it. How do you research and, and find out what they were doing on the sheep stations more than a hundred years ago? I mean, how do you come across that sort of uh, that sort of knowledge and information? Well, luckily uh, at Wanganella, there's a great uh, well just a treasure trove of information. Big old station ledgers where they record in infinite mm. detail the breeding records and what ram was crossed with what. And then it's a bit of a sort of follow the, the hoof prints, literally, to try and work out how did they do it. And it's still speculated, of course, but they had a, a really good uh, guy called Thomas Shaw, too, who's a, quite a genius wool classer. And he would go through, you know, thousands of sheep and pick out the ones that they thought were, were going to make the grade. So they had a sort of a, a, a very, uh, I guess, definite uh, plan in mind. And within, as I said, within 20 years, the Pepins had this extraordinary sort of big animal, which was then going all over Australia to, to new regions that they thought was were beyond the, um, you know, the grasp of uh, sheep. So, you know, really desert regions out in western Queensland and places like that. So it was, it was a really... Uh, they weren't the only ones trying it, but they succeeded really spectacularly. In, in reading the book, it was, um, it was uh, startling to me to find out how um, big an impact it had on a world stage. You know, in my mind, I, th I think that, you know, the pioneer Australia is, is so far away from the rest of the world, but it made a great impact on the, on the economy of the world. Can you tell, tell us about that? The breed, uh, the, the Pepin breed was uh, very fortunate and Australian wool growers were extremely fortunate. Up until that time that this sheep was developed, uh, a lot of squatters had gone uh, bust, of course. The wool price was you know, through the floor at various times. But uh, strangely, the, the American Civil War cut off 
uh, cotton supplies to England. So the, the yeah. spinners in Bradford, the big uh, spinning centre in England, started experimenting with wool. But wool at that stage was only, you know, very short, uh, five or six centimetres in length. So what the Pepins, though, with this longer wool, which was, you know, sort of double the, the length and, and uh, a lot bulkier, they started experimenting with this, this new type of wool. They found it could work on their looms. Suddenly, uh, tweed and, and woolen clothing became affordable. So we had this real transformation of the world textile industry, which was a great windfall for Australian yeah. sheep farmers, who suddenly then were... Everyone was out to get this particular strain of, of sheep. So by the 1920s, this sheep had gone to... This breed had gone to about uh, 12 or more countries around the world, so South Africa and Patagonia in the, uh, Southern America, uh, Morocco, all sorts of unusual places. It really opened up new pastoral frontiers yeah. worldwide. And what about today? What about... Are they still... Uh, do they still have Merino out at Wanganella Station? Very much so. It's still... Uh, well, that's one of the other remarkable aspects. That this study is still operational uh, 150 years on and in much the same uh, ownership as, as the, what the Peppins had. They had uh, sort of uh, big properties adjoining each other. The study is still in that, uh, despite you know, the 20 years of very bad wool prices. Uh, and that was really, the, the white knight there was really Rupert Murdoch, uh, as uh, he bought the, the start in uh, two, uh, 1978. And is now it's in the hands of uh, 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 one of the biggest stockbrokers in the country, Bell Potter Securities. So they're very aware of that history. And as I say, I had, I had access to these fabulous old station records and great old newspaper accounts and, uh, and, and other people who wrote about this much speculated uh, story. How did they achieve this remarkable animal? It's, it's really one of the great, uh, I think, stories of world agriculture, what they did. A great chapter of Australian history. Congratulations on the book, Thank Tim. you, Paul. Good job.